Welcome to Hot Chips 28. Keynote 2. Are we there yet? Silicon in self-driving cars. Hello, everybody. Welcome back from lunch. I uh, hope you had a nice lunch. So nice to get outside in the sun here. Um, I'm really happy to introduce our next keynote. Uh, when we first started having our program committee meetings, we, we just sat around the table and like threw out topics of, oh, wouldn't this be great if we could have a keynote on this topic? And I wish I had the list, I still kept the list, but self-driving cars is one of the things that kept coming up. And so um, I was just looking through the archives before during the break, and I, and I went back to Hot Chips 1 and looked at you know kind of topics, and. Hot chips ones like all microprocessors. And then I, I, I went actually just kind of clicked on, um, I think it was Hot Chips, let's see, 2010, six years ago, we had a keynote from Volkswagen. And the keynote was about electronics and cars. And it's really interesting to go back and look. I encourage you to go look at the slides. He talks about um, you know, driver assistance, you know, self-parking talks about you know, infotainment options in your car, navigation. Um, in fact, one of the things talks about the future, it says, get in your car, type in the destination, drive, right, and then and get there, right? And here we are six years later, and we're actually, we're not doing the driving. Something else is gonna do the driving. It's pretty amazing to think about. So anyway, I'm really happy to introduce uh, Daniel Rosenban. Uh, he's been working on Go at Google and a self-driving car for the past four years initially on subsystem sensors, and he currently leads the compute team on the self-driving car. Um, Daniel's a big chips fan, having designed his first chip as an undergrad working on a supercomputing project at MIT. Um, after earning his bachelor's at MIT, he stayed to get his master's at MIT and then his PhD. Um, during his PhD, he was drawn to the lure of startups, took a few years off to co-found a company called Sandburst, it was a networking chips company that um, designed high-performance switch fabric and a packet processor. Uh, Sandburst had a successful exit when it was acquired by Broadcom in 2006. He then worked at Metaram, a semiconductor company here in the Valley that innovated in the uh, memory and storage space. Uh, Metaram's IP was acquired by Google. Uh, next, he consulted for a number of companies, actually, where I met Daniel, um, before landing at Google to work on self-driving cars. In his free time, Daniel enjoys uh, trying to teach his 16-month-old daughter to use an oscilloscope. Um, maybe he could teach me someday. Um, he says it's definitely still a work in progress. So please welcome uh, Daniel Rosenban. Thank you, Brian. OK. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. I'm Daniel. Thanks for a kind introduction, Brian. Um, so I'm here today to talk uh, about the self-driving car project at Google. Um, I've divided the talk into roughly two portions. The first gives you an overview of, of why we work on this technology, um, what the history has been, and, and what some of the really hard problems are that we're trying to solve. And then the second portion focuses a little bit more on the semiconductor angle, right? looking at our sensor suite and the compute subsystem. I'll caveat the talk with the fact that there's no big reveal in the talk, right? I, I can't mention who we partner with or which specific chips we use. Um, but hopefully the, the, the audience gets an appreciation for how hard some of the problems are, how important semiconductors are to what we do, and perhaps some, some ideas for what future innovations may be that can help our programs and others working on self-driving cars. So first question, why work on self-driving cars, right? One of the things probably almost all of us encounter almost every day is driving down the highway and staring at that bumper ahead of us, right? That's, that's time where you can zone out a little bit, but you still need to be on top of things. And if you look at the statistics, right, the average person in the U.S. commutes roughly an hour round trip every day. 
getting that time back to people so that they can do what they like to do, right? Be it play games or talk to their children or read or sleep, right? That's really something that, that can have a pr pretty big impact on people's lives, right? An hour per day is roughly 5% of your waking time. So over a lifetime, there's a potential to regain multiple years of, of sort of productive, productive time. The second aspect when we work on self-driving cars is, is the safety aspect. If you look at the statistics worldwide, it's about 1.2 million people that die due to car accidents every year. Right? That's basically a good-sized city that disappears because of car accidents. Just in the U.S. alone, right, even with sort of high-quality cars and a lot of attention to safety, roughly 35,000 people die of car accidents every year. And to put that into perspective, that's really the equivalent of, of a good-sized passenger airplane crashing every single day. So anything we can do to put a dent into those statistics, of course, impacts many, many people as well. And then the third, third category where, where we really see a large impact is people who couldn't otherwise get around in a car. Right, this is a picture of Steve, who's, who's been in, a, in our car several times. Right, he's blind, and these days, it's for him to get around, it's, it's either asking family or friends for help, or he takes public transportation, which takes him about two hours to get where, where in a car he could otherwise get in 30 minutes. Right, so provi providing mobility to people who couldn't otherwise get around easily, right, the blind, the disabled, the elderly, there are many, many people in society, right, who, whose lives would really be liberated by being able to, to get around more easily. And so these three things I find are the most compelling thing when we work on the project, right? Of course, there are many other secondary aspects in terms of environmental, or perhaps you don't need parking lots in your cities anymore. But these really, if you think about it, if we can deliver on the promise of self-driving cars, are likely to transform the lives of many, 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 many people. So how do we get to where we are, right? That first picture I showed you of people playing a board game in the car is actually from the 1950s. It's a picture that GM put out on, on what driving may look like. And for a long, long time, right, there really was no practical way to turn, turn that vision of, of sort of people being in the car independent of what the car is actually doing. Um, this changed in the mid-2000s, right? DARPA ran the, the US Department of Defense, they ran a couple contests to see could you actually create drives that, cars that drive themselves. And initially, these were, the goal was to drive through the desert, right? You can see a picture here of, of one of those cars, right? And it's pretty rough terrain, kind of curvy, and the first time we ran this contest, um, with all respect and in a good way, but in many respects, it, it really was failures, right? Where cars weren't able to get very far. And the next time we ran the contest, there just was dramatic improvement, right? Where many cars could, could traverse the desert pretty far. Several of them completed the contest. And so I think that was probably the first realization that that perhaps self-driving cars could really happen. There were a few follow-up contests and simulated cities, which also were promising. And at that time, the Google founders, Larry and Sergey, who both attended these contests, they said, oh my god, this is something we should try out. And they put a, cont they put a challenge to, to a team that they hired. Right? These were many of the students that had graduated working on, on these DARPA Grand Challenge contests, as well as some of the professors, and they put out the challenge of basically driving 100,000 miles in self-driving mode on public roads. And if you think about this, this was 2009, right? As Brian just mentioned, at that time, hardly anyone thought self-driving cars was, was sort of within reach. Um, the team worked really, really hard on this, and if you're familiar with uh, the area, right, you can see some of these routes are actually quite difficult. Um, it's driving up and down the coast with really windy roads. It's driving in populated areas. It's driving near Lake Tahoe. It's crossing bridges, right? Many things that are difficult, and, and the team actually executed really well on this. They completed the 100,000 miles, and so 
at that point, it was off to the races at Google to, to eventually turn this into a real product. And just to give you a perspective of, of what was accomplished there, let me show you a video from, from that time. Actually, I'll show you the local one. All right, so this is Lombard Street, which is a super windy road in San Francisco. It was part of a challenge that the founders put to the team. And you can see it's a really windy road. This is a time-lapse video. It actually took the car pretty long to navigate it. But if you think about this happening a number of years ago, it's, it's actually quite impressive. So after we, we completed the, the, that, the windy road, right, the next thing we actually did is transition to, to driving on, on highways more. Right? Many of you in the area have seen the, the, the Lexus vehicles, and the, the driving down the highway was one of the things we, we did. We spent about 300 miles in self-driving mode. Sorry about this. So we, we took the, these Lexus vehicles, which if you've been in the area, you've seen driving on highways and now surface streets. But at this time, we, we really focused on highway, which in many ways is a simpler problem. You don't have traffic lights. You don't have pedestrians. You don't have bicyclists. Most of the cars are moving in the same direction. right? So in many regards, it's a simpler problem. Um, from there, we eventually transitioned to, to working on surface streets again. And the reason for this is primarily that one of the things we realized when driving on highways, that it's important to really solve a problem end to end. Right? This means that we wanted to deliver an experience where someone gets into a car, tells the car where to go, and then the person can totally zone out. The car takes, takes him or her wherever he needs to go and, and drops a person off. Right? And if you only focus on highways, that is not really an experience you can deliver. And if you look at just this intersection, that's obviously much more complicated than driving on highways. Right? You see lane markers are complex. You have to see traffic lights. There are signs that indicate traffic rules. Cars driving many different ways. So it becomes quite a more difficult problem. After that, if you've been in Mountain View, we also designed our own self-driving car. Um, the intent of this is to have a prototype that from the bottom up is designed to be fully autonomous, which means that it does not have to drive with a steering wheel, does not have a gas or brake pedal, right? but just needs one button that says go. The car takes a person to where they want to go, and then you get out. Right? We designed this in a, in a kind of neighborhood-friendly way. It's limited to 25 miles an hour. We, we drive very defensively, right, where if we see a big truck, we'll nudge around the truck. If we see a motorcycle, we'll nudge away from a motorcycle. Um, if we're at a, an intersection, the car will wait for a second and a half just to make sure that there's no pedestrian clearing. But overall, this was a pretty awesome thing to do to develop, to sort of think about what the experience would be and how you design something that, that could be totally self-driving. And most recently, you might have seen in the news, we, we have another vehicle that we're developing on. This is the Fiat Chrysler Pacifica minivan. And this, again, obviously, is a much bigger vehicle than the prototype one we worked on. But it also is, is a really cool vehicle in many perspectives from, from how people can, can interact within the vehicle. It has some nice features, for example, sliding doors. Right? It was one of the things we realized if, if you drop people off in a self-driving car, they, they kind of expect the car to do what it's going to do, and that may include closing its own door. And so having sliding doors is a pretty nice property. Okay, so that's, that's the history. Um, let's dive a little bit into how do we actually have the cars drive themselves. And there's, there's four, four primary areas that we focus on. The first is a car needs to know where it is. 
The second is the car needs to understand what, what's around the car. The third, what are those objects or, or people doing around the car, right? What is their behavior? And then finally, how should the car act? So in the first step of deciding where the car is, we actually put quite a bit of effort into developing more detailed maps than you would typically find, right? So we, we have maps that know where the curbs are. We have maps that at least know where some of the traffic signs are, where lane markers are, right? And so this gives the car a really good understanding of where it is and what some of the rules that apply may be. After that, right, now where we, when we know where the car is, we also have an extensive sensor suite, which, which is scanning 360 degrees around the vehicle and is trying to recognize what each of our objects are, where objects are located, and perhaps which direction we're moving in. And in this picture, you can see the pink objects here. These are for cars. You can see there's a there's a red object here, that's a bicycle. You can see we detect construction happening here with these orange blocks. And so this is something we constantly do, right? We, we, we generate a 3D model of what is happening around the car. The next step is really to predict what are all these things doing, right? When you're driving in the car, you don't only view it as a passive scene, but you, you observe how things are moving, and consciously or unconsciously, you also have a sense for, for how things are going to behave. And we do the same thing, and here's a nice example of that just for one of the vehicles. Right? So this vehicle is gonna come up to this construction site, and so we predict that it's gonna swerve around it into the ne lane next to it, and then move forwards. Right? And these types of sort of ability to predict how things are going to happen, is of course key to both safety and to having a smooth, to having a smooth ride. Right? Now we don't only do that for one of the objects, but we do it for every single object that, that our perception system can see. Right? And so what you end up with is for every one of the objects that we detect, we have a probability distribution of how that vehicle is, or person or or bicyclist is going to move through the scene. Based on that, right, we then come up with, we have a planner that comes up with a trajectory for how our vehicle should move, right? So this is taking all those probability distributions from our vehicles into account and coming up with a best, best trajectory for where the vehicle should go given its, its final destination. Right, now you'll notice in this picture, right, there are a couple of what look like horizontal ladders, right, so along with a trajectory. We also have these, what we call fences, that indicate things to take particular caution or be particularly careful about. And so if you look at it, this fence here, right, is fencing behind the car in front of us, right, so it clearly means that we don't want to run into that car. The fence is green, which means there's no danger of that happening, given the, that car's velocity and our own car's velocity. But it's sort of a cautionary thing to watch out for. And then you'll see there's this dashed fence, which is crossing the pedestrian walkway here. And that's an indicator that the car is being particularly careful about that area, because it's more likely for pedestrians to, to cross in that, in that zone. Right, so let me show you a video of, of what some of this looks like in action. I'm Priscilla, one of the test drivers on the Google Self-Driving Car Project. Our team is responsible for keeping the cars and other people safe while on the road, and for providing feedback on how they perform in the real world. A big part of our job is to go out into the world and uncover all the potential scenarios that a car might encounter. Then we help the engineers teach the car how to best navigate each one. Here are some examples of situations that we regularly encounter on the streets of Mountain View, California. We've taught the vehicle to recognize and navigate through construction zones. Our sensors spot the orange signs and cones early to alert the car of the lane blockage ahead, and we can change lanes safely. 
You'll also notice the vehicle typically moves to keep a safe distance away from large obstacles, like this truck stopped on the side of the road. Now we're approaching a railroad crossing, which requires special care. Notice the red fence and railroad sign that appears to the computer as we approach the intersection. This means that we'll wait until the tracks are clear of other vehicles before proceeding. Our cars treat cyclists as a special category of moving object. Watch in this example, when the cyclist holds up his arm, our software detects the hand signal and predicts his movement into our lane. The car knows to continue yielding to the cyclist passing by, even when he changes his mind, multiple times. We still have more work to do, but it's fun to see how many situations we can now handle smoothly and naturally. See you on the road. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a sense for some of the really complicated things we deal with, right? Recognizing which way bicycles are going to do, in some cases, why their hand signals, recognizing construction signs, many really complicated things. Now, given all that, one of the questions we often get is, well, so why is there no product that, uh, that sort of utilizes this technology yet? And, and the answer is that there still really are some very hard problems that we solve, right? And the, our primary objective is, of course, to deliver a, a safe vehicle. And just to give some examples of that, right, you've seen really complicated scenes, but things just like traffic light detection and recognizing the signal can be hard problems, right? And in most circumstances, a pretty simple algorithm that searches for red or green circles can be sufficient. But you also encounter, as you drive, many, many instances where the, the car needs to be far more aware of what's actually happening in the world. And, and this is one such example, right? In this case, as a human, you may take a second glance, but it's pretty obvious that that green circle is part of a sign, not of a traffic light, right? Uh, naive computer implementation may look at this and say, well, you see two red and a green, so not sure what to do there. The next example is a bit more complicated, right? And all these are real pictures, right? We didn't stage these or anything, but in this case, there's, there's kind of a reddish bulb on top of a telephone booth, and it very much sort of looks like it could be part of a, a traffic light. And again, as humans, this may require a second or third glance, but you can pretty easily recognize that this is uh, not a red light. Right? Of course, to teach computers to do this is much more complicated than, than just searching for green and red circles. This next case actually can be difficult for humans as well. Right? So in this case, there's a bus that's occluding the green portion of a traffic light. And many times, traffic lights are, are pretty dim. Right? So as a human or as a computer, you look at this and do you recognize it as a, as a dim red light or as a, perhaps a green light that's being occluded? And so you, you have to take that into account, and you probably will want to look for a second or third traffic light that, that should have the same signal, and, and then you combine results to, to come to a final conclusion. And then this last case, right, this is if you ever drive sort of at sunrise or sunset, right, with, with sun shining directly into your windshield, sometimes it can be almost impossible, right, to recognize what a traffic light is. And as humans, we, we don't have much choice other than sort of pull down the visor or squint or, or sort of follow the car ahead of us, right? But these are cases where for traffic lights, which probably many people consider a pretty simple task, right? Especially compared to some of the things I showed you, right? Even there, there are cases where we work really hard to build robust algorithms, have sensors that can help with the problems, and, and come, come up with really robust ways of recognizing what is really being signaled. Um, compounded with that, when we look at the hardware side of things, right? one of the cities we drive in is Phoenix, and as hardware engineers, sort of, we don't look at that as the most temperate place, right? because we often see temperatures above 100 degrees, sometimes even close to 120 degrees. And if you look at the sort of, we call it the dome on the top of our vehicles, right? We, we have a bunch of sensors in that dome 
I have a 100 plus degree direct sunshine onto that dome can, can get things pretty toasty. And so on the hardware side, we work hard both for temperature and shock and vibration, um, sort of all the automotive standards and, and concerns we need to address when we, we build these complicated systems. So where do chips fit into all of this, right? The, a lot of what, you show, what I showed you is, of course, driven by, by our software team and the amazing algorithms they've developed. But, of course, hardware is also an important component. And as part of that hardware, we very heavily rely on semiconductors for much of what we do, right? This includes embedded systems, which in some cases need to be incredibly robust. We have a lot of communication within the vehicle. Right? This can be between embedded subsystems or sensor to compute. Right? So there's a lot of communication. In some cases, high bandwidth that has to happen. But most importantly, and probably where we spend our most time on, is on the, on the compute and on the sensor side of things when we think about hardware and the semiconductors required for them. And on the, on the sensor side, we have three primary sensors that we use in the vehicle. That's cameras, radar, and LIDAR, right? So it's, it's more sensing than, than like a person does with just the eyes. On the compute side, we, I'll show you some pictures. We, we try to basically cram as much compute as we can into the car to, to provide our, our software team with, with sort of as much oomph as we can. To give you a sense for, for how these subsystems work, I think cameras many of you are probably familiar with, right? A camera subsystem on a car in many ways is not that different from a camera subsystem in your cell phone or a still camera, where you have a lens, lens system that projects onto an image sensor, right? The image sensor turns those photons, digitizes them, and passes them to an ISP, which turns that into a sort of a nice to look at image. And then you have a codec that either generates a compressed video stream or compressed images. Now, when we look at this from an automotive perspective, um, there's, there are many challenges that we encounter with cameras. Right? You saw some of the pictures of traffic lights. right? So overexposure and underexposure, those types of things are, are always big concerns. Um, but probably the two primary ones are one sensitivity. Right? We, we don't only drive during the daytime, but we also drive at night. And to have robust sensors that can see at night, that can operate quickly, right? the vehicle is moving at potentially highway speeds, right? so we, we can't have exposure times that are too long because everything gets blurred then. Um, so sensitivity is a very important aspect. And the second is really dynamic range. Right? On your cell phone camera, Oftentimes that's solved through HDR methods, right, where you take multiple snapshots of a picture with different exposure times, and through clever software tricks, those images can be combined into a, into a single image with very bright components and very dark components coexisting. On a car, that's much more difficult to do, right, for the same reason as I mentioned with sort of blurring artifacts. If a car is driving relatively quickly and you take multiple snapshots, tends to be really hard to fuse those images together. And so, so we very much look for sensors that, that enable us to, to have some, some form of integrated HDR capabilities, right? Some, some people working on new pixel technologies, some people mixing per pixel technologies. But it's one area where we expect quite a bit of innovation to happen as, as kind of a market improves and people recognize that, that some of the automotive challenges really are quite different. The second sensor, which at least to me is probably the most mysterious, is our radar subsystem. Right? Most of the pictures you see from, from people on radar are kind of what you see in the background here, where it's kind of a blurry mess followed by a blurry mess, and they do more and more DSP on it, and eventually it turns into a, a very sort of crisp and clear picture. And what it provides is, is really range information and velocity. Right? That turns into a really useful thing when you're driving, right, to be able to re reliably see how far away are some of the objects, how quickly are they moving, right? This cannot be done with a fidelity or resolution that, that you would get from some of our sensors, but it tends to be a really robust mechanism. 
on the semiconductor side, there's, there's really a lot that's happened there to make this possible in, in automotive and other consumer spaces, right? Just the ability to have tens of gigahertz kind of RF front end signals in a consumer pr product is, is pretty innovative, right? There's, there's companies developing single chip solutions for the RF portion, some of them perhaps with multiple channels. And really what this enables you to do, maybe I'll quickly walk through the, how the radar operates. You have a VCO that's putting out a tens of gigahertz signal. You modulate that right, with either a chirp or a ramp or some waveform. That goes out an antenna, bounces off an object, and then via a mixer you extract the high frequency component and very carefully analyze right, what is that remaining return signal. And using that, you can extract either through, you can get ranging information or through Doppler effects. You can get the, the velocity of things. All right, so lots of magic that happens on the RF side. And DSP, of course, anyone who's worked on radar sort of knows there's FFT after FFT that happens. But beyond that, of course, there's, there's a lot of processing to reduce noise and, and improve fidelity of, of what you get from a radar subsystem. The last sensor, or the last of our primary sensors, is a LiDAR, right? This, I find, in many ways, is the most magical of sensors, and in part because it combines so many innovative technologies, right? It's really marvels of optics, of mechanics, of sort of analog front end, and then digital processing. And to give you a sense for how it works, right? The, the LiDAR, it emits a laser light, right? As soon as you emit that light, you start a stopwatch, the light propagates and eventually hits an object. The light there scatters and some of the photons return to the LiDAR. And then you have a photo detector and some analog and digital chain to recognize that you've received a pulse and at that point you stop the stopwatch. Right? And based on how much time it's taken for that light to sort of travel through free space, hit an object and return, Right, you can compute how far away an object is. Right, so it's based on speed of light and how long it's taken. Now, the timing accuracy required to do that is pretty impressive. Right? Basically, for every millimeter of precision that you give up, that's roughly equivalent to six picoseconds. Right? So if you, if you want, say, one centimeter of accuracy, that's 60 picoseconds of precision you need on the timing control. On the chip side of this, there's quite a bit of cool stuff that happens, right? The, the photo detectors, there's a number of companies working on some pretty clever stuff there, right? And the, the magic always is, how do you receive as few photons as possible and still get a, a signal with little noise out of it? And if you imagine you're driving down a highway and let's say 100 meters away, there's a tire on a road, right? That's something you may want to observe with a LiDAR. And you can't send that many photons out to begin with, and you get very, very few of them back. So a lot of innovation happening on the photo detector side. The analog front end and DSP, there's actually quite a bit of diversity and approaches people take there. Some are very analog heavy, some are DSP heavy, right? But the, the key, of course, always is to, to recognize what is a pulse that you actually want to consider, and then what is a precise timing around it. And you can see in the background, this is actually a picture that's generated, we call them point clouds, of sort of a 3D information that's generated from these LIDARs. If you've seen some of our cars, you can see the LIDAR spinning on the top of a car. Right? So they're spinning, constantly shooting laser light, performing these measurements, and generating these types of 3D models of what's happening. Now, one of the questions, again, we get asked is, why do we really need all these sensors, right? As people, we can drive just with our eyes, right? We don't need LIDARs. We don't need to know to millimeter or centimeter precision how far away things are. We don't need radar to tell us how quickly things are moving. Yet, in our project, we've, we've invested very heavily into, into sort of getting the best sensors we can onto our car. And to give you an example of this, Let me show you a video. Right, 
Right, so basically what we're showing here is this is an artificial scene we created, right, where we have roughly 100 cyclists driving around our car. And to do this with just sort of camera would obviously be pretty difficult, right? A segmentation problem is hard, right? Some people look at using, for example, stereo vision for that. But for us, using LiDAR to segment a scene turns out much simpler. Tracking things, of course, we, we use a combination of sensors for that. But this is a nice demonstration of kind of being able to do that robust. Having more sensor data is, is a big help to get there. OK, switching gears a little bit to compute. So this is a picture of one of uh, the earliest compute systems we've used on the cars. And, and as you can see, this is very much like a standard PC. right? When, when the project started out, this is kind of the best thing we could to put together. And it evolved over time into a sort of roughly same performance, but, but more robust casing, better automotive quality connectors, those types of things, but, but similar class performance. Right. Once we started driving on surface streets, there was a, a bit of an oh my god moment where we said we really need a lot more compute. And the earliest prototype of that looks roughly like this, right, where we put a rack full of compute into the back of our, our, our vehicle. And it's, it's fun to put this together. It's not so fun to debug. Right? You can see there's a lot of wiring. and. In, in a car that doesn't always work so awesomely. Where we are now is we have a, a much nicer form factor, right? This roughly briefcase size compute sy subsystem. To get here, we really, we tried to use the very best silicon available, right? So the, delivering the maximum amount of perf compute performance that we can is, is basically the mission in our compute team. Of course, having a robust system, a system that can be cooled, doesn't consume too much power, is also important. But the primary objective when we build a system is, is really to deliver maximum performance. And without giving the details of what's actually inside, um, we hear often of sort of rumblings of his Moore's Law ending. But we've definitely been able to take advantage of kind of a, the best silicon available to really get a pretty dramatic bump in terms of performance that we can deliver. Right? And some of this is, of course, due to using larger chips, but some of it is also due to innovation that's happening in, in how do you architect chips to, to kind of get more performance than you otherwise could from completely general purpose processing. And if you look at this, the, sort of in the 2015 time frame when we, we, we focused more on surface street driving, we had this first big bump of performance. And we're working currently on our next generation platform that'll get us another 4x, roughly, improvement in terms of performance. And of course, we use a mix of components here. Right? CPU continues to be a, a really, really important part of our subsystem. Right? Where our software team, it's a favorite development platform because they can work on it most quickly. But in some cases, we also have to defer to more specialized compute to get the performance bump that we can. Right now, as a system as a whole, it serves us well right, when we operate in fairly low quantities. But it's pretty clear that as, as this becomes a real product and we, we, we need to de deliver larger volumes, that there have to be some innovations to, to kind of get this from a briefcase size compute system with probably the most expensive silicon you can buy to something that, that can practically be put on a car. And as a chips person, of course, I always think about, well, we should have more customized silicon to help us with these problems. And the problems themselves, right, some of them actually lend themselves very well to acceleration. And so we look at some of the statistics of what can be achieved there. Right? If you look at a 14 or 16 nanometer process, if you look at 16-bit floating point, which is probably sort of a sweet spot, right? some of the things we do require less precision, some of them require more. But you can get to, if all you're doing is math operations, you can get to roughly two teraops per square, sil square millimeter of silicon. Right? Now, of course, you can't design a chip 
with only math operations, but many, many sort of SOCs or, or chips fed with accelerators can be roughly categorized of having half a chip worth of a memory subsystem, quarter of a chip control logic, and the remaining quarter performing math operations. Right? And so if you, you scale the numbers from a previous slide, and right, a 100 mil square millimeter chip, this gets you to roughly 50 teraops of performance of FP16. Right, which, given sort of what people need, it's, it's a pretty uh, compelling number. Okay, the last thing I want to mention is we also do a lot of compute outside of the vehicle, right? We have a machine learning team that's constantly training models. We, we have a lot of simulation logs that we process. We, we run a lot of simulations. And so a lot of the talks that also have been presented here of sort of silicon that can go into data centers indirectly very, very much benefits our program as well. So with that, thank you. Especially want to thank the audience, right? As a chips person, I really appreciate all the work that's been done by the community to, to get us to the chips that we're able to use in our cars, right? If you, if you look at what chips were available 10 years ago, I don't think we could do what we're doing today. So really a thank, thank you to the community and many of the companies and people present here I'm sure have contributed. So thank you. Great. Um, thank you, Daniel. That was a great talk. It's really uh, interesting to see how far things have come. Uh, we have a couple of minutes, and Daniel has graciously um, offered to answer some questions. So why don't we just get, get to it? We'll start over here. Yes, hi, that was fantastic. Um, I do live in the area. I see your cars every single day, which is cool. They go back and forth. My biggest question is one about the human car interface in terms of intentionality, because I understand what you were saying about the, all the things we expect for traffic signals. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of the other drivers, so people can be erratic and do crazy things out there that they shouldn't be doing, the other drivers. How? <laughs> How, how are you thinking to deal with that factor in driving? Yeah, so if I understood the question properly, it's, it's how, do we, how does our inter car interact with, with sort of human drivers, where, where oftentimes you expect cues from a human that, that may be difficult for a right. machine to recognize. So we see that particularly, for example, at four-way stops, right? Where, right? where oftentimes you have cars that arrive sort of at the same time, and it's, it's a little bit of a flip a coin, who goes first? Right, so we pay attention to those things, and it's, we work on it both from a perspective of, of making it comfortable for a passenger in the car, right? We don't want to inch forward, slam on the brakes, inch forward. And at the same time, of course, we also observe we want to be fair to everyone else that's driving around. Right. And so, so absolutely, it's, it's something we, we are aware of and, and work on as well. And, and at higher speeds also, you know, as you're driving along. That yeah, cool. absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, question, I think there's a question over here. Mike? Hi, uh, this is a fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Uh, the question here is, uh, have you folks tried to put a small data center on the wheels? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so the question is, have we tried putting a data center on wheels? Um, I'll admit, internally, we actually joke a little bit tongue in cheek, but a little bit sort of in reality as well, as we compare our compute system to the top 500 list, right? Which year we rank in terms of performance that we deliver relative to those systems. And so not too many years ago, right, what we have in our car would, would be a small data center. Um, and so, so yeah, it's a very valid point. And, and we look forward to some years out to perhaps not entirely what it, you have in a data center today, but, but more performance improvements to, to sort of have even more awesome compute there. Thank you. For the questions, please uh, name and affiliation. I forgot to remind everybody. Yeah, John, John. Mashey, TechVisor. <laughs> so I have a question uh, related to radar and devices like um, uh, uh, implantable cardiac defil def defibrillators, which come with wonderful warnings of, like, don't go near Wi-Fi, don't, uh, uh, you know, don't stand in front of microwave ovens. The reason I ask is I had a ride in one of the highway, your highway cars a couple years ago from the Computer History Museum, and about that same time, uh, I got a uh, defibrillator, 
and I wondered if we got cars with radar all over the place, uh, should I be riding my bike by the road? And I actually sent email to Medtronics and they, nobody had ever asked the question. So do you guys have any statements on that? <laughs> like, is it safe for me to ride the bikes around Mountain View or not? <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question and I'll admit I don't know the answer. Um, it's, I know we have people that look at safety in all aspects very carefully and I haven't heard this particular one. Uh, I, I, just get somebody to ask the question. I mean, I'm not really worried, but it was, you know, it just sort of occurred to me. Hmm, no, I mean, it's, a, it's a very valid question, and, and I'll, I'll mention it to people. Thank you. You have a question over there in the book? Hi, Kevin Kriegel, Tourist Research. Uh, you mentioned radar, LIDAR, and, uh, and vision. Uh, you didn't mention GPS and uh, the mapping programs you guys, that Google does. How does that inform the uh, system? Yeah, so we call it localization as, of course, a really important factor in how, like, we have a maps, but we also need to figure out where we are in those maps. And GPS is one of the components for that. We also have other subsystems that include visual cues and other hardware mechanisms that help us track very carefully where the vehicle is. And GPS is a great example, right? Oftentimes it works really reliably, but especially when you're driving in cities, right, where you have multi-path problems, or you're driving through very mountainous terrain, effectively in a canyon, GPS can drop out. And so, so we, we've developed a pretty robust system that, that functions with GPS dropouts as well. And I've got a bit of uh, V2X, do you do any uh, vehicle to infrastructure uh, work? V2X, um, as far as I know, we're, we're not super active in that space, right? For those not familiar with it, it's V2X typically refers to vehicle to either pedestrian or vehicle to vehicle communication or vehicle to infrastructure. And like as a traffic light is a good example, if infrastructure existed where over Wi-Fi or other communication mechanism, a traffic light could signal I'm red or I'm green, of course that makes many problems simpler. Right? Our philosophy in the program has been to, to work in existing infrastructure. Right? Of course, we'd use anything that's available, but we're not overnight going to change all the infrastructure to, to signal our cars are present or pedestrians are present or traffic lights are one color or the other. So it's, it's something we look forward to in terms of being able to use, but, but not something we can rely on today. Okay, I think we have probably time for maybe one or two more questions, but Daniel will be around the conference this afternoon if you want to try to quarter him in the break. So go ahead, Chris. Um, Chris Rowan of Cadence. Uh, when you're building a extremely safety conscious system like a self-driving car, you have to think about extremely rare events. Today, automobile fatalities are on the order of one per 100 million miles. And if you want to do much better than that, you effectively have to drive maybe two orders of magnitude, a billion miles. You need to test a billion miles to know that you're really doing well. So how do you drive a billion miles, or whatever the right number is, in some combination of real driving or simulated driving? And when you tweak the system in some way, how do you retest that tweak against a billion miles of experience to know that you really have done the right thing? So how do you deal with ex testing for extremely rare events? Yeah, really good question. So the, we've, I think we've, we've driven close to 2 million miles on public roads so far, right? That's pretty far from the numbers you mentioned. And of course, we watch things very carefully. And today, we, we always have a safety driver present, right? So when these exceptionally rare cases do occur, we have a safety driver who could take over. How we plan for that in the future, we do operate on test tracks, for example, as well, where we can create these unusual scenarios. And of course, you can't think of everyone, but you can systematically create scenarios that, that are likely to cover a broad spectrum of what may happen. And that, along with simulation, gives us good coverage. And of course, nothing replaces sort of putting rubber on the road and driving. And so we spend a lot of time doing that. Okay, I think we have time for one more. Um, is there a question here? Uh, Mike already asked one, so I'm going to give some. <laughs> you can ask again after. Do you want to go ahead? Okay, Charlie Demergent from Semi Accurate. One of the big uh, elephants in the room on this is the legal status. And you read headlines about where you are and where you are not allowed to use self driving cars. But what about liability? Where does that stand? 
Like if you're in a self-driving car and it hits someone, who gets sued? Well, everyone gets sued, but who's responsible? <laughs> um, yeah, fortunately, I'm an engineer, not a lawyer, so I'm going to pass on that question. Right? We, we have a policy team, we have a safety team, we have legal experts, and, and they think about those problems. As an engineer, of course, we're, we're very conscious that, that we're working on a vehicle which, which cause, could cause damage, and we, we do everything we can to build safe systems, but the exact policy questions I will leave to our lawyers. Great. Okay. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions, but as I mentioned, Daniel will be around the conference, so feel free to approach him. He's very approachable, really nice guy. Um, anyway, I want to thank him one more time, and uh, we'll get on with the program. Thank you.